So as I said, my name's Kurt, this is Neil, and we're gonna to talk to you about pathfinding or augmented reality for the visually impaired. So let's talk about what visual impairment means. So there's a few different ways to talk about it. We're defining it as a severe loss of vision, not fully correctable, okay? But there's also the National Center for Health, which views it as a moderate or severe loss of vision. <clears throat> but it can potentially be correctable. World Health Organization regards it as from moderate all the way to completely blind. That can potentially be corrected as well. So they view it as 285 million people worldwide, over 100 million of which can have correctable issues. But there's a more general way of looking at it. And that is, it's a loss of ability to function, dependence on family or friends, and that means things like getting groceries, renting apartments. It means a higher likelihood of unemployment. Bottom line, it means being marginalized, being left behind, being forgotten. But it doesn't need to be that way. Now right now, people who are visually impaired use guide canes or guide dogs to help safely navigate their environment. They use magnification programs or devices to read menus or read street signs. They use audio cue devices to help cross the street safely, text-to-speech devices to read PDF files or to read the words on a web browser. But ideally, we'd like to be able to treat that. So there's medical or technological treatments right now for certain things. LASIK can help with cataracts, corneal transplants and retinal implants can be helpful as well for certain visual impairments. And in the future, you could use things like CRISPR for genetic therapy or even get a full eye transplant. So if you have a visual impairment and you've got a donor that matches, then potentially that all could go away, right? But LASIK and corneal transplants, retinal implants, those don't help everybody. In fact, it only helps a very small number of people among the huge group of visual impairments. CRISPR is only just now actually being tested in the laboratory, and full eye transplants, flat out not possible, not for at least 10 to 15 years or more. But there is something that we can use right now for the visually impaired, and that's augmented reality. We can use it in one of three ways. We can choose to improve the user's visual input, give them as high quality detail as possible. We can augment a support sense like hearing or touch to help supplement or replace information that's being lost for people who are visually impaired. And we can choose to combine sensory input, both visual and a support sense to give people as much information as possible. So let's give some examples of that. eSight is a company based out of Canada and they use an organic LED camera headset and what they do is they will amplify information that they get, so high sensitivity, high focus, high definition information that they will then project onto the lenses of this headset. They'll also maximize peripheral vision to make sure that the person who's using it gets as much information as possible, and they'll use autofocus as well, so when you're looking in a particular direction, it will help autofocus on that picture to make sure that you're getting as much high quality information as possible. And they even have bioptic tilt, so no matter where you place the headset or where you focus on in your vision, it will help make sure that it's getting as high quality information as possible too. Second headset for option number one is Oxsight, which replaces canes and guide dogs, or at least that's where they're headed and they are aiming to amplify the user's existing visual capability. So light detection, movement detection, object or shape differentiation, and they're aiming to make sure that it can help people who have at least some visual capability, even if it's degraded over time. Now option number two is augmented reality using haptic or audio cues, and one example would be Sedalion, which is an app by the company Float, and what they're aiming to do is provide different tones for object detection and location. So as a user is walking around, then it can use sound cues to help people detect the objects that they're seeing. And they also have a haptic or vibration feature through the Tango device that they're using, so that uh, if you have it turned on, then it will vibrate to let you know there's an object nearby. Now that's focusing on one sense at a time or even two support senses, but what we're doing at AugSense is combining audio and visual cues together to make sure that we're giving enough information for obstacle detection, 
depth perception, and we've added a pathfinding feature as well to help people navigate through their environment safely, make sure they reach their intended destination. And the reason why we are combining senses is because there are a wide variety of visual impairments, and it's difficult to address with only one augmented sense. So I'm going to show you a few examples of visual impairments that kind of illustrate that. So the first one is normal vision. You can see on the left side versus cataracts, which is blurry or hazy vision. It's caused by cloudiness on the lens of the eye. Second one would be macular degeneration, which can be caused by damage to the center of the retina. And it can result in uh, both even the total destruction of the picture, as you can see, but it can grow outwards with age, affect color perception. Third one would be glaucoma, which can lead to haziness or darkening of vision, narrower field of vision, and it can also grow more advanced with time. And, pardon me, damage to the optic nerve for that to happen. And then for diabetic retinopathy, which is a possible side effect of diabetes, it can lead to floating strings or dark holes in your vision. Also can lead to color perception, potentially even eventual complete blindness if it's not properly treated. Now, the reason why we're focusing on, all, on four of those as an example is even though they may have some similar symptoms, very different causes, they can uh, progress at different rates, they may require different treatments, or may have no treatment. It's very hard to augment one sense alone and address all of that. So we, by making sure you can combine senses, you can add as much information as possible so that your user gets enough to maintain their safety in the environment and make sure the program that they're using is useful. And to talk about this more, I have Neil Organ here. So over the past year, we've been working on AugSense. It's an AR application built specifically for the visually impaired. Current uh, AR and MR applications are widely being designed for entertainment, for advertisement, and even for adding a skilled user. However, we can do so much more. AR has allowed us to scan a user's surroundings and then going beyond that, intelligently interact with that user's surroundings. It's time to take this technology and put it in the hands of the visually impaired. Now, over our work in AugSense and looking at what's been going on in the industry, we found a few key guidelines that we'd like to share with you all that if put into practice, we believe it will help your programs reach the widest possible audience. So here they are, having multiple types of environmental feedback, allowing the user to customize their experience, designing for colorblindness, and designing for the user's peripheral vision. And I'll go into a little bit of detail on each of these. So, having multiple types of environmental feedback is important, especially for the visually impaired. Because we now have a great understanding of where the user is in relation to everything else in their environment, we can warn them if they're, say, about to walk into an obstacle, possibly trip over something, and we can give them a warning with a visual and an audio cue. Allowing the user to customize their audio and visual experience is important from a medical point of view instead of an aesthetic one allowing the user to customize what graphical objects and what uh, sounds are used for the cues uh, ensures that they'll be able to pick up the widest amount of information as possible. Designing for color blindness is important because if you are going to give your users, say, a splash of color, if they're going to trip over something, that color needs to be stand out from their environment. And then allowing the user to customize for their peripheral vision is important. As we saw earlier, visual impairment comes in many different forms allowing the user to pick and choose where the information that we're giving them and where it's displayed is going to reduce that information getting lost in their blind spots. But possibly the most important and most useful thing that we can offer to the visually impaired is pathfinding. Now the video that you're seeing playing behind us is a small portion of what we've been working on at Oxens. And if you could press play back there, that'd be great. Um, imagine you're at home and you have cataracts. Your vision is there, but it's blurry, so making out objects at a distance can be difficult. Just going from your bedroom to your living room requires careful stepping to make sure that you're not gonna accidentally trip over something. But with augmented reality, the user can simply say, take me to my living room. A line will automatically be drawn, avoiding all obstacles along the way from their position to their destination. They can use uh, audio and visual cues to guide them down the line and then display a splash of color and possibly a sound file if they're about to trip over something. Now, oh, we're fine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, t let's take a few steps into the future. Say you're at the Louvre and you're fully sighted. You've never been there before, but you've always wanted to see the Mona Lisa. 
Instead of having to consult the map or talk to somebody there for directions, you can simply say, take me to the Mona Lisa. A line will be drawn automatically between you and the painting. Complete knowledge of your environment can be available to you without ever having been there before. This technology is extremely important, not only because it can allow the visually impaired live more independent lives, it can allow all of us to experience our environment in a whole new way. And I'll now pass it back to Kurt for our final thoughts. Thanks, Neil. All right, so everything that we've shown up so far has been mainly for guidelines for platform developers and for programmers. But even if you are programming a game for AR or a travel app or a social media platform, there are still guidelines that you can follow that are related to these. So you can make sure you're picking a background that contrasts well with your text color. You can make sure that you're placing markers or beacons in your peripheral vision for the program to help catch the attention of your users. You can make sure that your text is sharp and clear and that you're not crowding your field of the user's field of vision. So even with these simple steps, even by just taking a couple more lines of code, a couple hundred more lines of code, or a couple thousand, whatever you need to, make sure that you're focusing on people beyond your regular audience not just the fully sensory capable, but people who may require you to overcome creative challenges to design for them. Design augmented reality for people who are visually impaired. Please don't leave them behind. Thank you. So I think we have just a, do we have a minute or two with things? Okay, so we got three, uh, three minutes with things for question and answers kind of thing. Uh, yes, uh, gentleman over here. How do you change the interface that you're going to interface, the objects and the content, menu systems? So when we build our menu systems mm -hmm. to be able to control lights and other functions using AR, we use head tracking and gaze tracking and make it fast. But when we do that, that menu design I'm sure it has to have something to it that's different. What do we use? Do we use shape changes? Mm -hmm. Do we use colors? Do we use animations? What's going to help the most? Do you mind if I take this one? Yeah. OK, Please. excellent. So one of the core things to remember is designing for multiple use case modes. Um, because you know some people like it. If you're designing menu systems that can be used by the widest number of range of people, you're also testing for people that are a little bit older, or maybe people that are you know don't speak the language natively. In the same way, when you're designing for accessibility, it means having different options available. Um, actually, one of the uh, apps that ships with the HoloLens does this amazingly well. It's called Fragments. And one of the cool things that they have is every single menu option they have has multiple ways you can interact with it. You can either use gaze-based for when you're looking at the different menu options. You can uh, use voice control to actually select any of the items, or you can use your fingers to basically interact with different objects. So if you're designing an application that's going to be used by the, uh, the visually impaired, basically having as many different use case modals as possible that are all supportive, that they will basically act as a core anchor for your experience. Uh, and we found that having as many triggers as possible works really well. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just add a little bit. Oh, sure. If you've got a lot of objects right mm -hmm. next to each uh, uh, that's actually a very good question. Kurt, you want to take that one with For many objects that are yeah. right next to each other, that's yeah. a differentiation. Well, it does help to have a platform and uh, better graphics to be able to make sure that it's as clear as possible. But there is some level of information that does get lost for people who are visually impaired. So if you have difficulty being able to differentiate between them, then you may be limited to things like being able to navigate safely and for it to be able to tell you where there's an obstacle. What uh, AugSense, we do intend for it to be used with guide canes, at least at first. So people who are using this program can see that there's something up there, that there's an object that's coming up, and then they can explore it with the cane as well and safely get by it. But in terms of depending upon what the menu is about, uh, uh, you want to give the user as much command as possible over what they're doing. So if you have a travel app up and your menu does not allow for things like, um, I need to travel to something there, and, and then it has assistive AI there to help, then you've possibly shut off a significant portion of people who would not otherwise be able to navigate your menu. So just having different options helps with things. Do we have any other questions with things? One quick one. Oh, yes. OK, one, one quick question. Anyone? OK, we're good. OK. Oh, yes, we also have a, oh, yes, we have a prototype here in the back with things after a talk. We'll uh, have it on the side if you, any of you would like a demo. So, yeah, I don't want to try a demo right now. Maybe 
someone that's willing to try it out. <laughs> <laughs> Quite possibly. I think we're a little short on time, though, but mm -hmm. we will definitely have it available with things. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.